It's an honor to have the opportunity to be with everyone and to help facilitate this meeting. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. So in case the context hasn't already been shared, I am in uh, the Baltimore airport, so there may be some announcements in the background that have nothing to do with this meeting. Please ignore. Um, at some point in the next 30 minutes, I'm probably going to get up and go through security so that I can get to my gate on time um, and duck out and Andrew will take my place, but hopefully by that time we're knee deep in a very healthy discussion. Um, but for now, we can get started. Anthony, um, do you, can I assume that everyone's already taking a moment to introduce themselves? Yes, we, we, we took minutes and uh, the, the, everybody who's here is listening on the Wikipedia page for the meeting and the link to that is at the very first link in the chat from today's uh, session. So if you want to see who's here and what affiliation they're claiming, just click on the link at the top of the chat. Wonderful. So I'll offer a little bit of context surrounding the meeting and our objective as well as um, I guess why Anthony and I decided that it might be valuable for me to lead this meeting in particular. Um, as I understood from Anthony, just given that we've developed a very close working relationship between our projects and otherwise, um, some of the, 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 the past details of the group's mission and vision, uh, its governance structure, etc., were going under review and there was some interest in looking at that more closely. And um, when I was presented with that, that sort of reality, um, I got kind of interested because I, I've, I've seen a real, uh, a real amazing amount of progress related to the SSBMG and, and its, its projects and, and members over the last several months and, and last couple of years, really. Um, seeing over the last half year, membership almost double, the way the projects have come together and how we've sort of organically started to collaborate more and more so and we're seeing synergies in, in the projects that are being incubated or supported within the SSBMG, um, finding a lot of value and momentum by working as a, as a group. Um, I mean, to me, it, it just spoke to there being a, a really amazing untapped potential. And so when I started to see the rumblings of a new, a new governance structure and a new vision, my thought was, um, given that we're business, in our own respects, we're all sort of business modeling experts, we may want to use some of that expertise in this case. And my thought is, at the end of the day, we, um, we have an existing function for this group. And my sense is that there's a whole other layer or layers of potential that could come from our continued work and collaboration, and that the existing vision and mission and governance structure, um, one, is, is not necessarily flourishing in the way that we might hope, but it's certainly not capturing that, that potential that we're uncovering. So I figured why not take this opportunity and go back to the drawing board a little bit and rethink what the SSDMG is, how it functions, really why it exists and what its purpose is or what its best purpose is, and, and do some broader thinking about how we can create um, really exceptional value and uh, a model for, for our continued functioning that will deliver the support that the group really needs in order to be stable, in order to remain viable, and to flourish long term. I think there's, there's an obvious burden that's, that's been placed on Anthony and some of the others that are very core to the group, and it, it's not really a, a sustainable, I think, um, model at the moment just because there's so much of a burden, and, and that's um, uh, challenging to, to maintain over time. So my hope for today is that we can look at some of the questions that I've outlined in the, uh, the wiki that was shared with everyone um, and really just come at the, the conversation about the SSBMG, what it is and what we do with an, a new set of eyes and, and openness to what's possible and what may be in our best interest for the future. So before we get into the questions, I just wanted to take a moment and give everyone around the table the opportunity to, to comment, to share feedback, to respond to sort of that perspective that I've just shared with your own thoughts and, uh, and, and ideas that may be related. Is everybody there? Oh, I see. Okay. So, I see. Maybe I'll mention one other thing, which is that um, I've had 
the luxury of, of Andrew Simpson um, agreeing to, to be my partner in facilitating this session. Unfortunately, I couldn't avoid a, a trip to, to Baltimore for an important conference and opportunity to speak and meet a bunch of people. So Andrew is going to be sort of our eyes and ears within the room. So he'll be facilitating, um, you know, calling on everyone and taking feedback and ensuring that everyone has the opportunity to speak. So thank you, Andrew, for stepping up to do that. And uh, I turn it over to you to sort of lead this little bit of the conversation for, for a few moments. I think that's your intention, correct, Randy? Yep, exactly. I, I just wanted to sort of share my opening remarks and get any initial thoughts or reactions that people may have, given that it's perhaps a bit, bit of a different approach um, and perhaps uh, something that people are excited about or nervous about or have other thoughts about. Just want to get everyone's perspective out on the table before we get into the questions specifically. Well, so if I, if I may, I, I don't, I don't want to start brainstorming about what the group could be at this point. I'm more interested if anybody has a reaction to the idea that there's maybe this opportunity right now to rethink what this group is and does, and that it's worth having a discussion. I'm curious if anybody has a response just to that idea alone. If there's anybody, if anybody feels similarly, they're surprised to hear that. If they think you know, we're due. I was just interested in getting some comments, more about perspective on where we are right now and, and the need for this call and the scope that we've designed, determined for the conversation that we want to lead. That's a great idea. <laughs> yeah, we talk about this a lot, except not with everybody. <laughs> it comes up. Uh, I mean, there really are probably three different purposes. We had one group form to deal with uh, you know, the original uh, development of the research, which was why it's, you know, the yes, it's BMG research group within um, this lab at OCAD, and perhaps the research uh, agenda should be pulled away from, you know, the, the practice and, uh, well, I don't want to just say practice, but the, the, develop, the development of it in the world, which is, you know, taking it into practices, connecting with you know, the, you know the, the international community, as we already have, uh, getting, you know, the, the coalition that has been formed over the last couple of years is a lot bigger than the research group. And so we do have at least those two mixed purposes. I also think there's probably a third purpose is really kind of the core business of getting the, the materials or framed and produced that will mean, so if you look at our corollary in the Alex Osterwalder um, group and how it was formed, they, they actually just worked with a, a small team of Alex, Alan Smith, Eve, and they had this <clears throat> online community. It was a small team that actually produced the materials and, 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 um, and developed that. So I think that's, that could spin off from the development group, but I think that those are different purposes. And, and when we, I think, People love attending the different talks, but when we have a research talk versus uh, development of something that's more developmental or practice-based, those might go different directions. We've always said that. I mean, there's different types of research I'm working on that I bring in from time to time, but, you know, it's, it, it, that might help us grow and, and help us allow us to grow so we're not trying to constrain it with the same business model. Reach purpose, you know, for those Well, it can also be a music to the team, a lot of the development. Okay, an R&D, could be an R&D line. Music models. Well, I think I think all four projects have been doing some form 
form of research, and certainly all four projects have been doing some form of development work um, in, in various different ways. And some people have also been starting to do um, a level of practice in that development work where they're getting paid for it. At least to some some degree. Mm -hmm. Right, so I think, I think it's important that we, do, that we be clear that when we say research, we're not just talking about you know, government funded church research. We are also talking about practical, up and running research projects that are on the ground. So and we need a broad definition of that research. I mean, but to speak to the four questions, so to, to speak to your opening question, uh, Randy, around is this a good time to revisit this topic, my answer is yes. And to address the first question that was on uh, the page around what's the group value proposition, you know, for me, the primary value proposition is the fact that we get to, um, we get to tune in to thought leaders in different aspects of the business modeling space on a regular basis and to share our ideas amongst us. So for example, you know, Bob's been there forever on the future fit business benchmark. Um, Randy's been there on refocus now for well over 18 months, going on two years. Um, Anthony, of course, on the SS, uh, on the flourishing business canvas, same thing. So I mean, there's a confluence of subjects here that are relevant, and it's a great way for you to stay tuned in to you know, the, the leading edge thinking that's going on in the space. I think that's the primary value proposition. You know, that's what keeps me coming. Folks online? That's as uh, said. Um, and just uh, chipping in, I sort of agree with everything that's been um, said. I, I guess the the angle that we were put in is, is just building on the the comments um, just made at the end there. Sorry, I, I couldn't see online who was actually speaking, so apologies, but whichever gentleman it was, I, I, I agree with that. Um, you know, we've been, obviously, at Future Fit, we're, we're focusing very much at the moment on the, the practical rollout. Uh, as I think you're all aware, we're getting great traction from um, a wide ranging number of uh, local corporates. Um, we're, we're just in the process of signing uh, the next development council member, um, the name of which I will be able to feel very shortly. Unfortunately, it's embargoed at the moment, but it's an extractive name, so it's uh, a very interesting sector to start working with. Um, we are beginning to get a lot of traction with uh, some pretty major investors across uh, continental Europe in particular. Um, this is helping to drive sort of that side of the, uh, uh, the uptake and production of data as well. So I, I guess from from our perspective, the, the 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 two angles to this group are one: how do we feed in um, our learning uh, and our experience so that that can help uh, inform and be a value to you guys, and how can we then help also promote um, the other pillars in the group? Um, and obviously, the flip side of that is how can we continue to to learn and, and benefit from all of the knowledge of everybody else who's associated with with this, uh, and likewise get the the future fit element uh, more widely understood and and promoted as well. So, kind of how do we get that convening power to 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 work to the uh, to the best of our ability. Go ahead. And then we lost you. That's our radio. Yeah. In Baltimore. No, I'll just go off. We'll be back, no doubt. Any, anybody else online? Bob or Florian or Undine? On the bill. Maybe a, a thought I would like to share um, because Peter talked about research 
and um, important research to improve the overall network. And um, what I perceive here in, in Germany and in Europe is that. Um, Sorry, can you talk a little bit? You're very quiet. Or gets it better even. Can can you hear me now? Better. Yeah, much better. Okay. Um, so, so my point is, is about um, agenda, research agenda, agenda setting, because what I perceive here in Germany and Europe is that many people are now getting more and more excited about the connection of sustainability research and business models, and um, yeah, my perception is that people more or less randomly start to pick topics to write articles about more or less random chosen topics. Um, so in the big picture, that all makes sense, but but I think it could be done more systematically, more strategically. And I myself, uh, I'm, I'm really looking for uh, for kind of a research agenda. And I think the big network that you guys created really has the potential to first set an agenda, which is, is valid globally, and to bring together all the people we need from research and practice to, to give life to such an agenda. So. In terms of the value proposition of the SSBMG, this would be, for me as a researcher, one of the most important value propositions we could create and propose to all the members. Thanks. Sorry, Anthony? Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, so um, what I wanted to mention, uh, and I apologize for getting cut out there, um, is just this idea that, you know, we have this existing focus within the group, and the group has been functioning, and I think there's a reality we have to deal with, and this is maybe something that I'm interested in Anthony and others perhaps speaking about it as well, just to get everyone else sort of onto the same page, because I think the reality that I've seen, or at least that I've experienced to this point, is that the group is not sustainable. The amount of time and effort that's being put in by a small few is not something that can continue, especially with the gentlemen who have been putting in the time getting busier with a variety of different projects and interests. And so beyond just finding a value proposition that is meaningful or valuable, I think what we need to actually be thinking about is how to create uh, a model for this organization that's actually viable, that's going to pull forward the kind of leadership and, and interest from the groups and individuals who are involved that's going to allow for it to be um, for it to be sustained, uh, for the, administ the administration of the group to be sustained. And um, as much as we want to think about value propositions uh, based on how we can contribute that, I think we really need to have uh, our eyes on the reality of the situation and what's likely going to draw support and interest, whether from the projects that are now on the table or the others within the community. Um, it seems like there's just a growing need for effort to, to be put into curating the community and the meetings and, and the coordination of everyone involved, especially because there's so many more voices and bodies. And unless we address that point as part of the foundation of this conversation, I think we may end up in the same position with uh, a group that's, that's not really sustainable. Anthony, do you want to talk a little bit, or does anyone else of the leadership group want to speak a little bit about your experience just in trying to get support and, and just the, the nature of the burden that you're dealing with? I'll, I'll let others go first, and if, if nobody else has anything to say, I'll say something. But I'd like other people to weigh in on that first. Well, I can certainly echo other concerns. If they're real, I mean, you and I have had this conversation on several several occasions about how to um, broaden uptake of contributory activity with others in the group to the running of the group. And I think that's the purpose of having a new governance model. And that's why we've got some new goals that we've identified in the government model. So I'm just going to say it's a real problem. We need to address it. And I'm happy to, happy to address it directly. And then Stephen Davies here. Anybody else have any comments on, on this point? Or I weigh in? Here you. OK, so uh, I. I that, thank you, Randy, for bringing this aspect of, it, of this up. And I'll also take the opportunity to respond to Florian's point about, um, you know, we, we are convening a global community here. Um, we've been calling it various things. We've been calling it a knowledge mobilization initiative. We've been calling it a community of innovation practice or an innovation community of practice. Um, and, and I, um, looking at some others in our field, like the Sustainability Transitions Research Network, 
as a research network, um, and I look at what they're doing, they're about 500 members ahead of us in their global community. Mm. Um, and the, the advantage that they have is that the primary movers in that research network have all got paid salary positions uh, in academic institutions or other research is that institutions. What you wanted? Um, no, this is um, this is the Frank Peels oh. uh, based oh. in Manchester. So I, I've just, for example, I won't go into the details, but I was just inspired uh, in the last few days reading their uh, September newsletter that they are doing on the research side many of the things that we are actually doing, except that they have got the funding and the organisation to be able to do it at a level that we're not able to. So they can produce a nice newsletter, they've got a website that's been kept up to date, uh, but they are clearly engaging with a wide community of, of people around the world on the research side of things. Um, of course, what they don't have that we have is these very practitioner orientated development and uh, projects and a, a broad range of people who are uh, coming at this from a very much more practitioner standpoint, which of course is where I'm largely coming from. And the chance for all of those folks is this is very leading edge stuff. And so it's very hard to um, uh, get paid for it. Uh, reliably at the moment, um, although we're making progress, uh, good progress. Um, and then specifically, if we bring that down to the group, um, you know, I'm probably spending somewhere between eight and twenty hours a month, I would guess, um, facilitating just the monthly meetings and you know, onboarding new members, having interesting conversations with folks. Uh, about what they're doing and, and trying to act as, a, as an animator for the group um, and you know doing the social media stuff so that's basically all me uh, has been for about a year now uh, prior to that Nabil was doing quite a lot of, of that work with me um, or even by himself on occasions um, but it's not sustainable um, you know we, we need to have some sort of we need to have more people voluntarily contributing and that's picking up as we grow uh, but we need to have more people voluntarily contributing, and we also need to find some way of funding some of the things that makes a community a community, um, that enables efficient sharing of what's going on, uh, that enables bilateral and trilateral conversations to have. Um, so yeah, so that so that's my perspective on it. Randy, go ahead. That's very helpful, Anthony. Um, I think it's good to know what the constraint is. Now, the flip side of the coin for me. Um, is you know we can obviously reference the the purpose of the group and, and its mission and what have you, but I think what's important for us to, to know to be really well connected to is the value that we're actually delivering and what the success of this organization is right now. So what I mean by that is you know we have monthly meetings, we have a 700 member group, 700 people aren't necessarily showing up. So I guess the question that I'd like to ask and and sort of get everyone to comment on is, is what value are we actually creating? I think there's a small number that are very much engaged in meetings. Certainly there's a lot of stuff happening online. Um, I'm not as familiar with the profile of the interaction and engagement and how value is being generated beyond just creating awareness of the information shared, but I'd love for us to get better connected to the reality of the value we're creating versus the value proposition we may feel we have as a group. Are you able to hear me now? Yes. I apologize. I was uh, futilely trying to be part of the conversation earlier, and it turned out that my system froze. So I, I just came back. Um, I just wanted to endorse uh, what Randy was saying before about the uh, the uh, very few members of the group have been carrying on the, on behalf of the rest of us, and that this is a timely discussion. Um, and we need to figure out a way that uh, is fair to the people that do take on responsibilities and ensure that this is adding value for them as well as for all the rest of us that are kind of hangers on. So um, I can see the value of, of some of the differentiation of the roles that has been proposed. Um, 
the, the challenge will be to have uh, additional people step up to those roles with all of the implications that that has on workload and so on. So it'll be an interesting conversation. Just while I think of it, my screen is showing nothing that's being shared. Is is there a, a document or anything that's supposed to be on the screen, Anthony, or is it supposed to be blank? No, no, we're not sharing anything. It's basically just, just the, the first links in the chat all back through the chat. Randy, it sounds like you've moved into the men's washroom. <laughs> it's uh, it's possible. <laughs> no, I haven't. Um, but I, I'm not sure what the background noises are. I have headphones, and so I can't even hear them well myself. Um, I, I wanted to bug you a moment, Anthony, because I, I appreciate that you know you're you're trying to be polite as you always are, and you really want to give everyone a voice and not make this about yourself. But I think if we're to if we're to try and answer that question about the value being created. You're the one that's closest to the members. You're the one that's doing all of the correspondence. You're the one that sees the interaction. And I think it would be helpful and productive, rather than beating around the bush, to get your perspective on really where value is being generated within the organization. Feel free to disagree. All right, well, I'll, I'll accept your invitation, Randy, and I'll, I'll give you my perspective. Um, so I, I think there is, again, if we go back to the original reason why the group was created, we had five streams of research and practice um, that we wanted to investigate all centered around this idea of strong and sustainable business models, different perspectives on it, from mental models to decision-making patterns to strategy to measurement to tools to be able to describe and design, um, and I'm probably forgetting at least one, but I guess in the, in the wiki, in the, the uh, vision, vision area. And I think that we are, uh, and, and we had a particular interest in looking at small and medium business because that's where we uh, thought the, um, the leverage point, the strongest leverage point is likely to be. And I think, uh, although we have not, as Nabil has pointed out on a number of occasions, got a defined set of metrics around how, how we're measuring success, I believe that um, we are making progress <coughs> on all of those uh, fronts. Um, so from my perspective, the value has been generated because all of the projects are moving forward in ways that they would not otherwise be able to move forward. So the group is helping, um, you know, the fact that in work that Stephen and I did in Germany, we, we tested out the uh, future fit uh, work, um, the fact that Andine and I are, are doing the same with both the Frozen Business Congress and the future fit work, um, the fact that Randy's incorporating bits of all of those into future versions of the focus. Um, to me, this is uh, you know, a resounding success um, and value has been generated on all fronts as a result of that collaboration and experience. And then, of course, there's just the wider sharing that's been going on. I know I've got a lot out of hearing what other people are doing, not only from those four major projects, but also uh, from other projects out there. So obviously, we've got Doug, uh, who's been doing some stuff on the culture side of things. Uh, we've also got uh, many of the other speakers who have been doing uh, other speakers over the last four and a half years, um, where I've learned a lot from finding out what they're doing, and I think other people like the feedback I've got from other people. So I think that's for me where the, the value has been generated, has been generated. Looking forward, um, as all as the major projects ramp up, the need for those projects to engage more widely with the community to have them deploy the thinking and the tools and get feedback. Uh, I think is significant. So, you know, one of the reasons selfishly that I was always interested in this group was because I saw it as a potential source of people who would want to use the canvas and therefore accelerate its, its growth and its use. Now, we haven't been able to animate that very well yet because we haven't produced that handbook, um, but a number of this group are first explorers and have been trying to use it, um, and uh, that process has been extremely valuable for me. Uh, and to the other members of the staff. Is that the sort of comment you were expecting? 
I, I think that's definitely helpful. Uh, you've, you've highlighted where value is being created. I guess maybe the question I still have is how does that how does that translate back to the rest of the group? So we have a 700 member group. Is it 30 people who are deriving value from this and a whole bunch of people who are just kind of looking for the latest news story? Are people engaged? What is the nature of the whole membership and, and what is the, the extent to which people are getting value in different ways beyond just the projects? I think that's a really important question because I think we need to recognize that even though the LinkedIn group may have 700 members, um, that 90x percent of them will be loosely coupled workers for the majority of their involvement. Yep. And that there is LinkedIn. Um, that there will be a core, there, there are a core of people who are interested. Uh, these would be those who showed up today um, to it. Um, and that we should likely be thinking in terms of, you know, let's just call it a core core interest group, and then there will be increasing rings of peripherality around that core interest group, depending on the specific topic of that. Um, so, so that which so and so that links back directly to um, Florian's offering around, you know, what is the research agenda? Uh, what is the integrated research agenda, and what what are, what are the core members of the of the network want to see in terms of that research agenda? So, uh, two two thoughts. Uh, one is um, the, the since all four of the major projects are um, relatively speaking underfunded. All of us have had a hard time with our strategy to engage more people. Because engaging with more people costs time and money. And um, as much as we know it would be good for us, it's been hard to do. So I, I think there's, there's, yes, there is a small group in the 700 who have been active. But I also think that the major projects have not been in a position to try and engage with more of the 700 um, in, a, in a more systematic sort of way. Um, so that's one, one comment. Um, uh, and I think that the, the research agenda question, um, I mean, although to Jeremy's point, we have not really discussed the streams of research and practice, that's the research agenda question since Mazur first wrote those words uh, nearly five years ago. Um, I also think one of the reasons that we haven't really discussed them is that they're not, that they, they have served us quite well, actually. Um, that they haven't been very controversial. Now, that's not to say we shouldn't talk about them now. But I, I think that's partly why we haven't talked about it previously. I think they, they, they're good if you go and look at what they say. I put them in the wiki. I put them in the wiki. You can go and put spam, but they're, they're pretty well. Uh, I just say it's okay that we don't have an integrated research agenda. If we have common visions and common goals um, across the different projects. But it's also the nature of academic research to academic freedom to just to go in the direction that it, that researchers don't have the ability to pursue. You know, we all have different opportunities to write, different content disclosures, whether they're still in graduate or whatever. We have different collaborative relationships with different institutions that will lead to different research. So I think one of the best things we can do is to, you know, not integrate the agendas, but not our, our curate them. Sense that is to, to have our, this group be a part of this group. There's a research group that could be coordinated across different research agendas so we can see where the commonalities are. I mean, I'm working on things I don't think I'm not sure anyone knows about. I have uh, publications that might actually be closer to what Doug is doing. We haven't even talked about. I'm very interested in the last year in cultural sustainability, but, uh, which is similar to a social, a very large scale social business model, but using our framework you know, so a, as a tool and using the, um, using the flourishing business canvas and other tools that we're developing. And, and I should be probably you know, connecting with you, I just have, I'm just doing publications first, seeing who connects to those and then taking it from there. You know, so that's to say, you know, as a, as somebody who is, working on research out, and I know Florian has a more dedicated research agenda because 
you know, Dave, who's been working more definitive area for quite some time, he might have a very focused agenda. I might be a little more sprawling, but I am, you know, I, I am working on this piece of things. That's, so perhaps what we, we need is a way of unfolding research projects together in a way that helps us collaborate better and understand what each other is doing. Does anyone else have anything to add? Uh, yeah, I'd, um, I'd like to just build on what people said. I, I think uh, Anthony's suffering from the little red hen syndrome, that everybody would really like to enjoy the bread that the little red hen is making, but uh, not as, as, uh, as able to contribute to the baking as we'd all like. So th th there's a real challenge here. From the point of view of research, the people who are most interested in research are, are the folks who are employed by universities. So they have jobs. They, they have the ability to weave that research into uh, their responsibilities as an academic. And, and that's great. Uh, Anthony doesn't have a job. Uh, I don't have a job. Um, and in a way, I guess the Future Fit Foundation is in the same place, and so is Refocus. So the foundation, Future Fit Foundation, is in a little better shape because they're raising money and they're a, a, a charity, so they've got the ability to attract funding. Uh, and uh, Martin is doing an amazing job on that. So Refocus, Anthony and me are, are kind of struggling with how to make this thing work. From my point of view, I don't care. I, I'm going to do it anyway, so it, it, it doesn't make that much difference. But the real challenge is that I need the deliverable. Uh, from my perspective, the role of the canvas is really, really important to our ability to get some traction in the business community on something as aggressive as the Future Fit Business Benchmark. Because when companies throw up their hands in despair and they say, you know, science may say that that's what we should be doing, but there's no way we can do that. That's when we need to be able to have a fallback and say, well, you know, with your current business model, maybe not, but uh, perhaps you'd like to explore other options uh, and see what a redesigned business model might look like. And that's where the canvas comes in. So it's a tool uh, to help companies realize that there, there are options for them. The challenge is that, that it's not a tool that is ready for, for scaling up in terms of use. It's not as documented as it needs to be. The guidebook isn't there yet, and we don't have the time or the money to be able to develop it. So from my humble perspective, what I really would like to see is the same thing that the Future Fit Foundation has, which they call a workshop in a box. I'd like to see a similar kind of thing as a, as a canvas in a box uh, so that near mortals out there would be able to run a workshop um, with some level of confidence that it's going to work. So that's, that's what's in it for me, that the value I'm getting from this is an incredible opportunity to think and rethink and rethink all of the foundations of the, the common work that we're all working on. But from my perspective, um, what I need is a deliverable that would be a workshop in a box for the canvas. And if there is some humanly possible way to raise funds for that without the strongest sustainable business model group becoming a charity or refocus becoming a charity, um, then that would be really terrific. Because right now the, the, the formula doesn't work because we don't have funding. It's, it's, it's pretty, pretty basic. Bob, could I ask you just to, to um, clarify the role you see and the value you see of the, of the project, which is what you've just been talking about, versus the group of all the people working on all the projects? Okay, the, the value of the group is that it allows us to scale. Once we've got something which is a little bit more um, portable from, from a, a nucleus of people to other people, uh, the reach that you have so masterfully um, uh, evolved for the group allows us to scale fairly, fairly quickly, and that's great. Uh, the good news is that the credibility of the tool is supported by the academic research that's been done on it. So 
the value of the academic research to me is to ensure that <laughs> the tool is a good tool. Um, and I totally respect the fact that there are other things that uh, research can do in conjunction with this. But I, I must admit that I find myself more interested in the pragmatic uh, availability of, of the tool, of the canvas, uh, in, a, in a way that allows lots of people to use it in a variety of different ways. Um, some of whom are in the ex incredible network that Anthony has, has built up, and some of whom uh, are not yet part of it, but perhaps could become of it. Does that help? That, that does help. And Mark, Martin has raised his hand. I just, I just found the button to raise my hand, which I, which I, I quite like. Um, uh, sorry, Randy, can you mute? I can't hear a thing when you're not muted, sorry. Oh, great, thank you. So I just, I just wanted to um, pick up on what Bob is pointing to there, because um, just listening to the conversation going on, it, it, there's, there's a clear disparity here between two groups that people keep pointing to, that the word research is uh, naturally being used a lot. So there is, uh, if you like, there's, there's an academic community in the room. I'm not saying anything you don't know, I'm just, just pointing to this. And then at the same time, there's this practitioner um, element. And I think perhaps some of the challenge that is, uh, is, is arising as this group is growing is the different, and, and not necessarily conflicting, but different priorities of those two groups and how one goes around trying to fund those different groups. So I, uh, I guess that the, the question in my mind then starts to evolve to is, is this an, an academic research focused group, which is capable therefore of going uh, after pots of, of research funding that, that then is, is, is trying to, to push that out and learn through the practitioner groups, or is it the mirror image of that, i.e. Is, is it a practitioner focus group, in which case it needs to be funded accordingly, and as Bob has already said, at Future Fit, we've, we've gone around sort of setting up a sustainable business model that we're trying now to pursue, um, and, and drive this group more from that sort of a perspective, looking to feed it back into, um, uh, uh, back into the, the funding of the, um, of the research and grow from that. Um, but I think trying to sort of see which, which is the priority and which is the lead piece is going to make it a lot easier to perhaps come back and to answering the questions around these put forward. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. That was very helpful. Uh, Randy, I think you need to go through security, but you wanted to say something before you do. Perfect. Yeah, I think uh, Bob and Martin's points are very well taken and, and timely. Um, I think the the elephant in the room is is the funding piece. And this group isn't sustainable unless we have a source of funding that will enable us to at least have some secured administrative support and the potential for securing additional support for for some of the objectives that we're pursuing through the members therein. Um, I guess my question would be, regardless of which direction we go. Um, what are our best projects, or prospects, I should say? You know, we've just created a new relationship with uh, the new VP at, at OCAD. You know, could that be um, a channel or an avenue we could pursue to, to look for funding support on an ongoing basis? Does it make more sense to think of this group as an incubator or accelerator focused specifically on sustainability-oriented business models and frameworks? And uh, if that's the case, you know, does this group proactively seek out additional ventures and startups or, or, or concepts that may look like what the Flourishing Business Canvas or Future Fit looked like three or four years ago and try and bring them along the same path and, and model success through a, a similar formula? Um, I'm not sure what the answers are, but I think in order to answer that question about viability, 
philosophy and, and our future success, we have to be really clear about what, what's going to bring some dollars in so that we can sustain the group. And ultimately, um, I think our focus should be determined based on what's going to allow us to continue. Because I just don't know that we can keep doing what we're doing um, without someone dropping dropping dead or, or um, us just fizzling out eventually because focuses are elsewhere and not necessarily on the success of the group and it being at the center of what we're trying to pursue. And on that note, I'll, uh, I'll tap out for a few minutes. I'll, I'll just simple burnout. Just simple burnout, Andy. Doesn't, um, so on the on the funding side of things, uh, Florian, did you have anything you wanted to add? Not wishing to put you on the spot. Um, maybe just a very general comment. Um, I, I was making the point about the research agenda and the potential. I see in the SDMG, and I think um, here in Europe we're used to these big um, Horizon 2020 programs, where you, where it's common to have projects funded in a range of two to four, or maybe even five million euros, yeah. um, where you can set up big research consortia. And um, I know that, especially for people like Anthony, it's a problem to to continue contributing to this group without permanent funding and maybe bigger research funding programs might be something we should explore more intensely. Um, even transatlantic programs, it's, it's, this exists um, to look for yeah, medium-term funding for people who, who really drive this group and um, this could also involve transdisciplinary practice-oriented research. Um, it's just a question about um, yeah, looking systematically for open calls. Um, and in Europe, we have open calls next year, for example, um, dealing with issues of sustainability innovation. Our, our SSBNG topics would also fit as an example.
Um, it's a very good idea. Um, it's a reasonably, um, how can I put it, high risk strategy. Uh, I have had experience of Horizon 2020 bids and stuff like that. Um, actually, in other contexts, we, we haven't gone for the, the future fit. Um, I, I wasn't actually aware that they, they were eligible outside Europe, so but Florian might be able to correct me on that one. Um, because the UK is now outside of Europe as well, so that probably doesn't help. Um, moving on. Um, oops. Yeah, that's, I didn't vote it. Um, I, but look, I, I think if you if you can get those sort of large scale fundings, then obviously the opportunity that that opens to properly resource this group, properly pay people for the time they're putting in, fund people to come in, fund the practical activities. It it it's absolutely you know, superb way of, of really driving change. And, and speaking on behalf of Future Fit, we'd obviously be, you know, delighted to try and, to the extent we can, support such an initiative. But they are a lot of work to put the funding proposal in. Um, and, you know, the chances of success are there's a lot of people chasing modest sized pots of money. Sorry, I unmuted myself. I think, I think for me, the mere existence of this group for the work that we're trying to do, and I think it's, it appears to be the same for everybody, is really, really important. Um, and if you think about the value that we're getting with absolutely no resources and um, you know very little ability to to even animate the work that we're doing ourselves and bring that um, knowledge and experience and research back into the group, I think it's in all of our interests to come together and collaborate in being able to not have one or two people trying to push this forward. But I think it, it's, it's important for all of us to, to be part of that movement to ensure that we can sustain the group and then obviously allow it to grow. Because if we can, you know, if we if we can really get it up and running from a well resourced perspective, the value that each one of our organizations or our projects or our research will gain out of it is huge. So my comment is how do we all come together? and look for the right opportunities or you know and pool all of our kind of credentials together and you know endorse it from all of our organizations so that we we can build something that's you know very uh attractive to fund
And, and um, I want to go back to what Martin originally offered around the distinction between an academic research-based orientation versus a practitioner um, action learning development-based orientation. Because I think, and this, and this might be heretical, I'm going to take. I'm going to, I'm going to say it anyway. I'm going to say it anyway. Okay. What if? What if we're really just a bunch of really bad quality entrepreneurs who are unsuccessful at developing our ideas into marketable products? What if? What if we suck at that? And really, we're masquerading as a research group, but we're not actually a research group. What if? Just putting it out there. <laughs> And, and it, because, because, to be honest, I look at the development activities that Bob described. So Bob described the development activities. He wants a shop in a box for the flourishing business campus. Right. To me, that's not research. No. That's a development no, no, activity. No. That's a development activity for right. practitioners to actually drive adoption of the core concepts underneath the FBC. Yeah, and, 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 and carry well, on. When you look at our strategy and tactics, what we envisaged was developing things like a, a, a workshop in a box or a toolkit in a box for the purposes of trying to learn about what elements of that toolkit are effective. Right. So at one level, I completely agree with you. Developing the, the toolkit in a box is a practitioner activity um, for the purposes of having an impact with practitioners. Mm -hmm. But at the second level, I think we're all humble enough to recognize that this, our understanding of strong sustainability and flourishing in an organizational context is far from complete. Uh, and, and it's even less complete when one starts to ask what method, by what methods can one most effectively enable organizations to design their business models so that they create strong and sustainable or flourishing outcomes. And so there's a research move there back. And so the, certainly the way I've always thought about this is, is, is this is action research. We are, but if you don't have that research link, our ability to um, accelerate the, uh, the impact that we can have and incorporate the latest knowledge as we go forward is highly limited. So let me be heretical as a researcher. This is Peter. We've done a lot of research. We're actually we've got a pretty good base of publications, and we've got a group of others that are working towards that. You know, where a good entrepreneur will take half-assed research and start doing things with it right away because they see the value in it. And a half-assed researcher will become like mine, like me, will be entrepreneurial in that they'll start writing about things that are not very well formed, like the application of the flourishing business canvas to a society, you know, to the flourishing society, flourishing policy or other framework, adapting the framework before it's even been tried and, and Completely trial. A good, a normal social sciences researcher wouldn't. They would wait until they had um, not just publications, but that they had completely assessed and could could support the value of the FBC before taking other contexts. We're starting to spread it out, so we do have this kind of hybridization going on already. What's missing for me as an entrepreneur, though, is is on that side. Steve is referring to is being able to see a, a monetized path to value proposition that would be with an organization that's paying for it or you know with a client as opposed to uh, funders. I mean I've mm -hmm. I filed for a shirt grant in our first year, you know, for you know, so I, I went through the work and, and we didn't we didn't win with the, with the insight development grant. And we could try that again. But I'd be more inclined, you know, I'm, I'm also having conversations with other, with business entities, well, primarily healthcare, because I think that's where, where there's going to be a market. So we are perhaps following different markets that we have access to, and maybe Stephen's right, we're just not developing those yet, but we also don't then have a toolkit for, a for our practice. We don't have the full workshop toolkit. We, we can do good workshops. But we don't have the lead behind the collateral, the books for the clients. Those would we give. I mean, those would give us the confidence to make a professional presentation, charge more, develop more. If we had that, as if we considered that our table stakes, we didn't worry so much about getting it funded. We'd probably get funding just for 
having those materials. That would get us to the next level. So I think we've been to add, you know, to add a little bit of a heresy that we've been waiting for someone to fund the development of the toolkit. But if we bootstrap that, we probably pay it back. Um, I mean, if we really looked at you know, being entrepreneurial with that, we probably pay it back in less than six months. Oh. Can I try again? Is this working? Yes. Okay. Oh, round three. Hey. I'm running out of uh, browsers to try. Anyway, um, uh, I was going to ask a naive question, but if someone with deep pockets like a big bank or a big corporation or something got religion on this and decided to fund this effort with a couple of million dollars, who did they write the check to? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, so, so, so the so the short answer to that Bob, would would be probably OCAD, um, and um, the, a secondary answer could be Tides. So we've been talking with Tides Canada, which for, the, which for those folks outside of Canada is a um, a a, um, a service organisation that is a charity that provides services to other charities, basically under an umbrella. So they can they can accept the money and then. You as a project can do things under that charitable structure. So we'll be having conversations with both. Both. Of them. Would you not need to be a charity yourself, though, to be able to tap into the tides? You need uh, a project of tides. A project of tides. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so far, it, the OCAD approach, though, is the one that that is the one that seems to be working, or the most preferred. Well, the boundary gives us is being able to work with grad students too. So. Yeah, I think the answer to that is it has to be OCAD since the SFBMG is housed within the S Lab, which is a feature of OCAD University. Yeah. And okay. any other answer other than that would uh, kick up the foundation of the group. Yeah. And, and and had had Robert not arrived when he did, I mean, we were only starting to investigate other options because Robert's predecessor and the institution as a whole had basically. Uh, I don't know. Put, I'm not sure if they were active roadblocks, but there were roadblocks that existed um, to prevent us from going down this path. But I mean, you know, we're sitting in an OCAD facility this afternoon. We're using OCAD uh, space. Uh, a number of us have OCAD industry partnerships. Um, so the the institution has done um, some things to support us over the last five years. And to your knowledge, is it possible for foundations, more traditional foundations like McConnell or Ivy or other foundations, to fund a university? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. So, so you've got tons of McConnell funding right now. Yeah. So, so you need, you kind of need the uh, the the nest that you are in yes. as uh, a vehicle for you to be able to accept and apply for for funding, so that those people who do the funding uh, can get the appropriate receipts. That, that's correct. And, and um, I mean, I mean an, an OCAT has, in the past, for example, Bob received money from the Rockefeller Foundation, which of course is the people who are funded DLA. So right. again, we just haven't managed to have these types of conversations with decision makers in OCAT who can then decide to invest more institutional resources in helping us with the hard work, as Peter alluded to, of actually writing and winning those grants. Thank you. Good question, Bob. Um, so back to the point that Stephen and, and Peter were both, in their theoretical way, uh, bringing up. So the way the way I heard both of you was in this. That the, one of the strengths of this group, one of the reasons it's different, and, and again it goes back to the way that the bill wrote the original strategy and tactics. Is that we are actually not a traditional research, nor are we a, a traditional entrepreneurial group. We are, we are actually very consciously sitting in a, a figure of eight, if you like, between those two, um, and explicitly taking advantage of the best attributes of both, while struggling with the disadvantages of both. Is that a fair sum? Is that what you two were just saying, or have I misunderstood you? If you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. <laughs> <laughs> As Neil Perk yes. originally wrote, I, mean, I think that's a fair observation. And, and are you advocating that that's okay, that that's okay, or are you advocating we should make? I'm okay if that is a consensually accepted identity by the folks who are participating in this right. this this gathering. And 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 I 
I, I walked a little bit earlier earlier around the use of the word community because community to me is a bit of a sacred word. And and it doesn't I don't use the word community until the members of the community recognize one another and it is integrally constituted. We have a group here. We aspire to community. Um, we have communion amongst some members in the inner core. Um, and you know, you know we, we, we're, we're heading in that direction or we aspire to it, but we're not there yet. Right. Right. Sure. The only thing I would add to this is that uh, I think what's really exciting about it now is a diverse thing that is much bigger than that. I think that's where the problem stems from, is that you don't get academic grants without pulling researchers and going after other research institutes who are all gonna who, who all can meet those qualifications. Likewise, you're not going to get businesses involved unless you actually have a group of businesses pulled together and, and a proven track record of more of a practice-based innovation lab that they're gonna fund. So the dilemma of being in the middle is that you're neither, you don't do either well. So that's one of the reasons why I thought one of the strategies could be to actually use the pool to gather together the people who had interest in those different areas and start to establish arms where you really could own that territory. So for instance, get the researchers, researchers together, especially if it was global research, because you could actually go after Kind of global resources, and and actually Canada is really supportive of that, just like they're really supportive of universities that have innovation or entrepreneurial arms, because they really want academic institutions or labs to be working with industry. So I, I think if you if you started seeing the SSG as having you know, different aspects. And, and maybe that's one of the ways to manage workload as well, is that those different arms could also manage different workload. But as a community of, of different people together, right? What's your thoughts? Any jokes? Randy, how, how, how much of this do you need just to unpack a little? Which might be a bad thing to come towards the end of that time. Yeah. We can't hear you, Andy. I, I didn't quite catch the catch question. There's a little bit of uh, a noise around me, and I uh, just was getting myself settled. Sorry, could you repeat what you asked, Andrew? Sure. We got 10 minutes left, so I figured you probably wanted to do some kind of wrap up next steps. Well, I mean, I'm not sure how, how much the conversation has progressed and the sharing of ideas. I mean, it sounds like you've come to some pretty productive points of uh, inquiry. It, it almost seems to me like we're at a stage where we need like a weekend retreat to sit down and rethink the whole thing and put in the, the intense time, energy, and, and thought that it would require to really define an organizational purpose and direction newly and to etch out some next steps that would make sense whether we choose to define the purpose based on the current context or if we want to explore a few paths and define the purpose based on where we get traction. Um, any any thoughts in, so in response have, given? So, so we do have this impending next meeting with Robert Luke, the new VP of Research and Innovation at OCAD sometime in the next two or three weeks. And we, we do need to make a clear ask of him, a, a clear first ask of him, I should say. Um, and, and certainly this conversation has been very useful to inform our thinking about what that could be, um, you know, in terms of how, how big a scope or scale we want to be thinking at. Um, the, um, so we, we've got that immediate uh, takeaway, and, and if anybody has any particular input or thoughts about us, um, you know, Stephen, Peter, and myself would welcome that as input. Um, could we, could we perhaps very straightly just explain our situation and and our sort of our, our, our impending 
point, or at least you know, the fact that we're at a stage right now where we need to choose a direction and explain to him that we'd love to collaborate and see what he thinks could be viable if we're looking for funding from OCAD specifically or through him so that's, um, and see if he has ideas. So that's, that's what we've done so far in our two meetings with him. And the, the report that uh, I, I wrote on behalf of all of us, uh, a draft, I should say, was, was given to him. And I asked all of you for your uh, feedback on that. Um, and if you haven't been asked and you want to see it, then let me know and I'll, I'll share it. Um, and um, that report had a number of possibilities in it, um, most of which were more general, I would say, than some of the items we've been discussing this afternoon. In the idea of going after some larger shirt grants or some uh, EU um, Horizon 2020 funding um, was not in that report as a, an explicit possibility, um, although in broad brush terms it was there. Um, so so I, I, I wonder, Randy, um, I mean, I, I've heard people today. So let me replay what I think I heard and, and ask for corrections. I, I, I've heard people make some um, important um, statements of definition about what we are and what we are not, and where we aspire to be and where we don't aspire to be, which are currently not in our um, streams of research and practice, our vision and our mission. That they're hitted at, but they're not front and centre in, in the way that several people have spoken this afternoon, and I, I include Martin and, and Bob and Florian and Stephen and Peter and, and as people have made statements like that. But at the same time, I also would say that I haven't heard anything that strongly contradicts what's in this uh, research practice vision and mission either. I haven't heard anybody basically say we should tear it up and throw it away. Um, so I, I think, Randy, that's my impression, but I'll stand to be corrected if, if people feel um, but that's not the case. I feel it's evolution, not revolution, is what I'm hearing. Vision and mission still uh, is still valid. Um, the only element of it that I would uh, hook at um, is the if we focus on SMEs. But, but there's no doubt in my mind that that's a planetary imperative. Yeah, it has to, we have to do this, and, and and you know we have this in a wiki for a reason, right? It's because wikis are something that a group can edit and hack at, and we don't use the history. Um, we haven't actually been using the wiki for that purpose, but it's there and it can be used for that purpose um, if, if we we as members choose to, to use it that way. Um, does anybody have any thoughts about, to, to round this point about, you know, the, the weekend off-site, which obviously, given we're an international group, is very, very, very hard to do. Um, has anybody got any other practical thoughts on, on you know, whether it's discussing the, the research and practice vision and mission, or whether it's, you know, assuming that Robert Luke says, yes, that's a fantastic idea, we should do an EU 2020 joint share submission. Um, and obviously, we then have to convene a group of people to work on that. Um, any practical thoughts on on your guess? <laughs> Should we do a business all kind of time? I think that might be a good idea. But again, it's still with me, we'd have to get people to well, want to devote time. But I mean, the nice thing about it is it can be done yeah. remotely and collaboratively. Yeah. In virtual reality. Yeah. But any, any thoughts on, on the practical point of Randy's proposition? I think it's a point. I mean, as, as, as we get. Maybe as we get into November, or perhaps early December, some of us who are really busy right now are going uh, during the school term and conference right now. We may not be able to envision a good period for this, but it might be a whole weekend. But I think the idea of a retreat, um, at least a period of sustained hours with with, I would suggest a, a kind of pragmatic outcome as well. I mean, I think this is, I think we have the same goals overall, and we're struggling with uh, an identity for the future. Uh, we've never really rebranded this group, and I think that's something as simple as deciding who we're going to be 
what the name is going forward. You know, the SSDMG is fine it's for internal research group, but we you know, we've moved to flourishing. We haven't reflected that in our name. It's a matter of starting to like the be the group that group that that, that we want to proceed with in the future. So something that could be part of part of the goal um, of, 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 this, uh, of this next meeting or retreat vision board is just who are we going to be? Um, what name, you know, we want to come out of that with a, a brand and identity that's consistent with flourishing. And that's and that would give us, I think, the momentum in the next not out. Um, the different online identity, position, the same people, ask the same, most of the same messages, but framed in a way that we're presenting ourselves to, to the marketplace in a different way. Concrete. Andy? I just want to make a quick comment about the value proposition of the group. I think. They are definitely, having listened to everyone's comments, uh, similarities, but I think it would be a really good exercise to ask members of the group to share the value that they experience from the group so that we really have a good sense, an idea of what this group is, is, um, is being able to give from a value perspective right now. Um, because I think that, you know, that, that's what needs to be communicated to OCAD. Maybe I can turn that into a specific ask of everybody on the on the call. If uh, if Randy or Andrew or I were to start a a thread in the LinkedIn group uh, with that question on Dean's just posed, what is the value that you received out of this group? Would all of the folks on this call uh, be willing to invest the time to write up a few sentences? In, but as their response, which hopefully would then engage with more of the, light, the larger the group, uh, to get them to provide their responses. I would, I would rather than say receive, I would say value you wish to co-generate. Looking for, looking for, right. what is the value that you wish to co-generate for right. this group? I'd rather also know what people have done. You know, just a yeah, summary of some yeah, 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 I think it's an and. Yeah. Well, sure, it sounds like it's an individual response, but uh, you know. So, so, so would, would people be willing to, if, if we can create an appropriate yes. question, yes. would people be willing on the, on the call to, to do that? Can I say yes, but um, for the people, if, if you are understaffed, Mm -hmm. Then to tabulate all the information, it might be more work for the, the, the small core group. Does it make any sense to narrow it down into um, some, some options that are easier for the 700 to respond to? Or is it, do you simply want verbiage? I'm going to do a quick survey. Uh, I mean, there's significantly more work in writing up a survey than there is in, in writing up a few questions. I mean, there's problems on both ends, right? You're either going to do the work up front or you're going to do the work afterwards. I, I, I think I was just responding to Andine's thought in the moment. As a next step. As a, as a, as a, ne as a next step to, to uh, in, engage with the wider community in a slightly different way than we tended to do up to this point. Um, and see what comes out, basically, as, as to, to help us inform our next step. Um, I could be wrong, Anthony, but I think you'll find quite a wide variety of, of value that people get from it, and I'm not sure that that we'll know quite what to do with it after that. Uh, it, it'll perhaps reinforce the the, uh, the many different values that people get from the group. Uh, maybe. Uh, but, uh, an I, I, I wonder if having some of that available back out into the group yeah. um, wouldn't actually also be a useful thing, a, a reflection, basically. I don't know. I'm not sure. Maybe uh, the other part is uh, we talked before about the value of the group being part of OCAD. I'm wondering from the point of view of OCAD, what's the value of the group being part of it? 
um, what's OCAD getting from it? And yeah, and the, and, the, and the report, Bob, had a whole section about that in order because we believe that this group is generating significant value for the institution, which the institution has up to this point not chosen to exploit. And, and we think it's a significant opportunity for the institution to exploit it. So recognizing we're over our time, um, I want to make one final ask. So uh, we do have a regular scheduled speaker for next month already um, scheduled, already scheduled. Um, but this is an important conversation. And I wonder, from a time zone perspective as well, given Florian, it's now nearly midnight. In fact, it's just after midnight for Florian and Martin, and it's uh, 11 o'clock for Martin. Um, whether people would be prepared to start our meeting uh, an hour earlier uh, next month, so at 3.30 in the afternoon, um, explicitly to continue this discussion. By, by in a month's time, we should have more information about where, where our conversation with Robert Luke is going, um, and probably some other data points as well. And I would hope and encourage all of us to continue our conversations as ones and twos and threes um, on all the different topics that have been raised. Would, would people be willing to meet an hour earlier? In, in principle, yes. Um, okay. So, so, so I, I will, I will set that up for next, for the next month. Um, and um, so we'll start at three thirty on Tuesday, November the whatever Tuesday, November the whatever it is eight. eight. So the second Tuesday. So please mark your calendars. Three thirty Eastern Standard Time, uh, which would be nine eight thirty British Standard Time and uh, nine thirty European Central European Time. Are we going longer as well? Yeah, we'll start at six. Yeah, so we'll have an hour. We'll have an hour on the future of the group, and then we'll have our normal ninety-minute uh, content presentation. Any other closing comments? Recognizing we're, we're over time. I know Randy's had to drop off. Right. Any other closing comments? I wanted to thank everybody. This has been a very good conversation from my perspective. Thank you. Okay, and if there are no other comments, I'm going to end the recording and uh, we'll uh, we'll take things from there. Thanks, everybody. Good night.